Something to think about with Dale Happy Knowles. Okay, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, we have a special treat for you tonight. Back, back in Living Color, live in Living Color myself, and I also have one special, 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 special person we're going to talk to today about some very special <laughs> things that has happened a long, 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 long time ago. We've heard the descriptions, we've seen the perspectives, and we've felt the rhythm for majority rule. But have that of motherly love? Have you actually experienced that? Motherly love as it relates to majority rule? This evening, we'll explore the perspectives of those that are the foundation of the movement. Hello, 242, and welcome to Something to Think About with Dale Happy Knows, and powered by Dom Dev Enterprises, innovative solutions for modern challenges. What you think you become, what you feel <clears throat> you attract, and what you imagine you create. Let's change the narrative two for two. Subscribe, like, follow. Don't forget to share, 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 because this is going to be some heavy, deep stuff that we're going to be talking about tonight. <laughs> and also, remember, if you want to, we have an advertisement avenue where we help the underprivileged and those of need. So if you want to throw some fun some away, contact us at something to think about 242 at gmail.com or on the Facebook page. So tonight we're going to talk with a special, 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 special guest. And so we have with us, and I don't see the profile. With us, um, Marion Bethel. The profile. So she is an avid um, activist, as you may know. She's a special lady because she goes by her name, her, maid, her married, her born name, as we say, not the government name, the whole name. And so when you hear that name, you know special people. You can just call a name and that's special. And so they know that. And so what we know of Ms. Bethel is that she is actively involved in the women's movement in the Bahamas and the Caribbean since the mid 80s. She, was, she has worked in the area of human rights, um, principally in regards to gender equality, gender-based violence against women and girls, sexual health and reproduction rights and ab abolition of the death penalty. In 2012, Ms. Bethel produced a documentary film entitled Womanish Ways, Freedom, Human Rights, and Democracy. The women's suffragettes movement in the Bahamas, um, 1948 to 1962, but we'll question that in a minute. And then uh, in July 2014, Ms. Bethel was awarded the 11th CARICOM Trinarial Award for Women for her noted contribution to the field of gender and development in the Caribbean. She was re-elected to the Committee of the United Nations Convention on the Elimination, <clears throat> elimination on All Forms of Discriminatory Acts, Discrimination Against Women in November 2020 and will commence her second term in July 21, which is now. Special people, like I told you, special, special, special. You know, come from good blood. So, but we'll leave that there for now. So, welcome, Marion, or should I say, and Marion, or I should say, cousin Marion, or what I should say, Marion, lo lovely Marion. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me, um, Dale, my cousin. Happy. <laughs> cousin, it's really you. good to be here with. Yes, thank you for being a part of this uh, first show as a solo act on Facebook. 
Uh, people have been harassing me for the longest to do this and yes. just put it on the side, put it on the side. But, uh, you know, got a little bug with on the radio the other day and now um, just continue to go forward. Right. So everything is revolving around majority rule. And majority rule, in my understanding, is about access, equal access, equal access for each and every citizen across the board, whatever race they are, whatever gender they are, whatever religion or creed they are, all, all of those things, equal access, and for that access to be equally applied. And so we talk a little bit about majority rule, but I really want us to dig into what is, I believe, was the foundation for the movement that allowed that to happen in a big way. Right. And so um, when we look at where we were back in time, when a lot of our young people, including people in my age group, doesn't have an idea as to what were the conditions back then. Um, could you just touch on that um, for us and then um, and give your uh, definition as to what, what the majority rule um, would yeah. be? Okay, well, thank, thank you, Happy. Uh, again, really pleased to be here to talk about one of my favorite subjects, the women's suffrage movement in the Bahamas. Um, I think it's important, um, as I uh, review all of this material, to really understand what majority rule is and what it's about historically, not just in the Bahamas, but what it means as um, a democratic principle of governance, which, which applies to any country, not just the Bahamas. Um, I, I, I think that we tend to feel that majority rule is peculiarly um, characteristic of the Bahamas, and it's not, you know? So majority rule as a, a democratic governance principle simply means one person, one vote, in its most reductive, um, uh, understanding, one person, one vote, and it really is um, a voting rule that, that says that the majority is governed, sorry, the, the, um, the consent of the majority is required for governance, the consent of the majority. So, so here in the Bahamas, we, we certainly attach a, a, a racial component or an ethnic component to this, but that is not what majority rule means in its general understanding dating back to Locke and Rousseau. Um, it's a democratic principle of one person, one vote. And so, and, uh, and it's a voting rule, which simply means that um, the majority of, of uh, a majority carries the day in an election, let's say. All right, so I, so I want us just to be very clear on that. Now in the Bahamas, it, you know, and majority rule is not peculiar to the Bahamas. You had, you had a, a, the struggle for majority rule in Southern Rhodesia, where you had a white settler uh, population. You have a majority rule struggle in South Africa. You, you had it in Bermuda. So it's not peculiar to the Bahamas. And so I want us to really understand that and to understand that majority rule is a democratic principle of governance. Yeah. All right, so, so let's just keep that. Now, certainly in the Bahamas, it has its, its racial component because again, in the countries that I've just mentioned, uh, South Africa, Southern Rhodesia, which is now Zimbabwe, Bermuda, you have a white minority government. So you have a, a majority of people who are of one ethnic group and a, a, another um, ethnic group that has the governance the, the, that dominates the political structures, the economic and social structures. And so this is what pertained in the Bahamas. And so the, the way that it translates then, it does translate in many ways into um, uh, such as black majority rule simply because the ethnic population here that was in the majority were people of African descent. And, um, and in terms of the white minority rule of, of, of European descent. So, so I just want us to, to keep those kinds of concepts very clear in our mind. And so if, if we look at majority, the road to majority rule in the Bahamas is really one about deepening our democracy or, 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 or establishing strong principles of democracy. And one person, one vote is one aspect of that. But there are others. You can have 
freedom of the press, uh, freedom of assembly, freedom of association. These are all components of democracy. Right. But the one that we're concerned about tonight, I think, is, is the issue of, of the majority ruling or the majority being represented in governance and uh, political institutions, and therefore majority rule, um, one person, one vote. So the first time that the Bahamas or Bahamian people really had um, a, a stake or a chance to exercise one person, one vote was really in the 1967 general election. Right, but before you go there, and specifically um, the build up to that, because I mean, right. there, was, there was a lot of conditions that existed in terms of popular right. open voting and all kind of Hinduism, um, exactly. um, Hinduism, what you call it, magician stuff. Right. So, so up to 1967. So, so let's so, so let's so, so let's move from 1967 and go back. So, in in August August of 1965, what happened was that the then leader of the opposition, the Progressive Liberal Party, Lyndon O. Pindling, was so um, determined to 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 um, enact the principle of majority rule, meaning one person, one vote. Um, that he went along with six other, seven other people to the United Nations to, 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 to present a petition to the UN to say that, that um, the white minority government was frustrating the road to majority rule, okay? And they asked the UN to please persuade Britain, because we were still a colony, and, to, which, and then Britain would persuade the, 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 the group here to do what it had to do to ensure democratic principles and, and the road to majority rule. So you had people like um, Clarence Bain, Milo Butler, you had Reverend Brown, Arthur Folks, Arthur Hanna, Doris Johnson, and Cecil Wallace Whitfield making this petition. Again, people who are on the other side of the fence now were a part of this as one global absolutely um, movement of the people. Exactly. And, movement of any political party. It was a people's movement more exactly. so than anything else. Absolutely. So, 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 so we used the UN in 1965 to, 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 to make our petition, make our plea for, for a more, uh, uh, for a democracy or, or an aspect of democracy, one person, one vote. Then moving back from there, this, this was August of 1965, what precipitated this very, very dramatic move to go to the UN was um, Black Tuesday in April of 1965, where, where in, in Parliament, um, there were, uh, again, the, the opposition, the Progressive Liberal Party was completely frustrated because of the, constituents, the constituency boundaries, which were incredibly unfair and, and um, translated to the benefit of the white minority government. Yeah, what do you call gerrymandering? Yeah. United Bahamian Party. And so April 1965, again, was one of the very dramatic times in our history with the mace going out of the window and the hourglass um, to demonstrate the, the, um, the people's frustration with the kind of governance that was undemocratic and not allowing participation of the majority of the people to exercise their, their, their right to vote. So you had the, the April 1965. Now, the, the election of 1962, again, undemocratic in the sense that you had um, uh, you still had the plural vote the plural yeah. vote existing in 1962 so so highlight for people what that plural vote means what 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 it meant in 1962 and prior to that is that you could have a, a single person could have uh, more than one vote so it wasn't one person one vote you could vote twice and your second vote depended largely on property all right so if you had a prop a property in, in Adelaide, for example, you could vote both where you lived, let's say in, in Nassau Center, and you could vote again in Adelaide. So in 1962, the plural vote was still possible. So this... Yeah, so, that, so just to be quite clear on that though, the mm -hmm. plural vote mean that if I had property in Adelaide and property in Grand Mahama and property in Acklands, and then I also had businesses, if I know um, no right, then for each one of those, I was able to vote in those places for that. Thing. Okay, so, so let me be very clear. In 62, by 62, the company vote had been abolished. So, I, so I'm just dealing with 62 now. Okay. So, 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 so let's go okay. back a little further. In 1959, the, the company vote was abolished. So yes, 
if I had a company, and mostly, and mostly, most of these um, uh, uh, assets translated for the benefit of the white minority government and, and the white population. So if I had a company and if I had property um, prior to, to 62, yes, I could vote three, four times, mm -hmm. a single person. You can, yes. vote, you can vote through your company, you can vote through your residence, and you can vote with as many properties as you had prior to 62. But in at one point, they were all open ballot. Votes, so everybody knew how you voted exactly. at one point. Yeah. So, so you had open ballot um, pr even prior to that, exactly. So it was so intimidation. So there was all of yeah. these kinds of, of, of um, pressures uh, in terms of, of, of who voted and how you voted. Right. All right. And even before that, um, up until 1959, when, when um, men, you know, all men could vote, prior to 1959, not all men could vote. So prior to 1959, only men over 21 who had property could vote, whether you were white or black. There was right. no racial component at that point, but you had to have property. Right. Okay. All right. And, and then moving, moving on. Yes. And then moving on even so, 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 so all men could vote in, in 1962 and all women could vote in 1962. However, there was still a plural vote. That was right. Exactly. So, so from the earliest of times though, um, I want to be very clear that the, the, the right to vote was, um, was based on being white and being male and owning property. That was the earliest, like in the 1700s and the 1800s. Of course, you're talking about um, uh, slavery also. So, so there were there were huge parts of the population that were di totally disenfranchised. But, but traditionally speaking, the, the 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 vote in the Bahamas was male and white and over 21 with property. And then moving forward, um, things became a little more um, uh, improved. Mm -hmm. But up to 67, we still did not have the capacity for one person, one vote. And that is why 67 is such a, 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 a very important um, date or year in the Bahamas, because we had struggled from the time of slavery for yeah. freedom and for democratization, for governance. And um, it, it, it was a long, long process. And so mm -hmm. um, January 10th, 1967, is the culmination of the struggle. And um, there, there were many other huge factors along the way. There was a 1958 strike, um, the general strike, which opened up a lot of possibilities, both for male suffrage, for one, and also um, for, for labor rights, for the rights of, of, of working people led by Sir Randall Fox. Mm -hmm. So, so and even before that, you had the 1942 Burma, Burma Road riots, which was really one of the, uh, the first kinds of, of um, uh, mass protests of, of, of um, black people um, to, for, for, for their rights and for economic rights in, in particular and equality um, in labor. So, so we've had a long history of struggle for, for, for boundaries, fair boundaries, for constitutional change and for electoral fairness. And 67 was the culmination of that. And so majority rule is, 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 is a word that the Bahamas, Bahamians have latched on to with, 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 with vim and vigor. And it overlaps very clearly with, with, with ethnicity in the Bahamas, as it, as it does in southern Rhodesia, as it did in, in Africa, in, sorry, in, in South Africa. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, but you have majority rule in almost every democratic country, but it, which is right. a different ethnic component. So I just wanted to make that very clear so that Bahamians begin to think of it in, in, in terms of democracy and governance and, and, and what that means. Okay, so on, and on that point, just to, to put a little bit more context on that, in terms of persons not being able to vote and have a say in, in its political, political say or in its leadership and the like, what was the climate like in terms of somebody who, who lived on top of the hill, below the hill, around the corner from the hill, what, what did that actually mean? Because when, we, when, it's, when the youth look at it today, they, they tend to think that everything was today like how it was yeah. way back then. And they say, well, you had 50 years to do this and stuff again. 
you right. can do it. I mean, like that, that, the barren of that don't make logical sense. But if you never were there or wasn't able to see it, then I could see why some people don't have an appreciation of what that means or what the struggle means. Right. Right. So, so, so up to 67, we were living under a, a, a colonial, um, a, a, we were colonized uh, subjects of, of Britain. And up until 1834, we, we, we were, we were, um, people of African descent were, were enslaved for the, for the most part, for the majority. And so moving out of slavery into the early 1900s, I mean, the, <laughs> the, 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 the white elite, um, economically, they, they had uh, dominance both politically, right. socially, and economically. So the majority of the people were disenfranchised, not only in terms of, of the vote, but um, their, their access, to, our access to education, our access to health services um, were, 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 were severely diminished. And, and there was also the, the um, social aspect of, 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 of racism and, and social prejudice. I mean, black people could not go into, into hotels, for example, um, um, and, and were restricted in terms of where, of, of where, where we lived. So, so there was, there was racial segregation. Um, uh, the majority of the black population was, was poor, hardworking, and um, didn't have the kind of, of access to, to economic resources and economic empowerment. Let me say, let me say poor and hardworking, we're talking about like fishing and, yeah, so, so, and so, 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 yeah. Domestic so, work or? Domestic work, hotel industry, the seasonal tourist industry certainly um, um, captured a so lot you of- You broke, of, you of, broke up just now, Marion. Because, you, people. because it, 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 I'm saying, I'm saying the seasonal tourist industry, which was, which was the, uh, captured a lot of the, um, of, of, domestic workers and people working in, in, in the hotel industry. There was right. uh, subsistence fishing, subsistence farming. Um, people were, were, were teachers and nurses. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, there, were, there, were, there were certainly people who, who had a small, small businesses, um, grocery shops, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So it was, um, it was a, a very uh, difficult time for, 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 for black people in particular to advance in um, in the areas of education uh, and and, and uh, finance the economy and po and politics in particular I mean that was very much dominated by the United Bahamian party and and so-called Bay Street boys yeah and so when we say United Bahamian party and Bay Street boys we're talking about a small clique of people yes because when you look at it, even those persons who might be as light as me or lighter mm -hmm. uh, were not necessarily treated with favor just because they were of the same complexion. Um, that's my understanding that, that it really was more of a, uh, for me, type of environment with friends, lovers, and, uh, and benefits kind of thing mm -hmm. versus it being across the board of a, as a pure racial to do. I mean, the race issue was there because of the majority of those who had dark color basically was left out. But mm -hmm. there were also those who were very light skinned or white who were not a part of that clique, who mm -hmm. were also treated the same way as the, the black. Yeah. So, so, so if you, if you were to have gone into a, a, a bank, for example, or, or a store, it would have been Mostly, um, the, the tellers would have been white, and and um, stores would have been mostly um, with with employees that were either white or or very light skinned. Yeah. So um, when was it then? So when people could actually have a bank account? Uh, do you do you remember that? Because I know my grandpa, and my grandmother always used to say when she said, "Let's go down to the penny saving bank and the rest of them," and the right. importance of that is because. Exactly. A lot of people were not able to have the accounts. Right. So, so certainly for me, growing up as as as, as a child in in, in the um, mid fifties, I mean, we we used to bank at, at the Penny Savings Bank. I mean, banks like the Royal Bank of Canada, etc., were, were were way out of uh, out of out of reach for for the um, for the average um, black Bahamian for sure. And um, you really had to have access and and um, connections. 
to, right, to have right. that kind of access. Yeah, so if we, if we spin back around a little bit and look at that movement up to the majority uh, rule day or milestone, because I see that movement has not really actually stopped, but, uh, or should not have stopped because all of the um, issues might not have been achieved. The political equality might have been achieved, but all of the, the social and uh, economic um, issues that traveled with it, yes. or were the, the, the hindrance of it, did, we're still trying to achieve those. So if you look at, at, at that, there, there was, I, I'm always saying mindful that we had the 400 years of slavery and then you had the overlap of the 300 years or of, of colonialism. Um, one physically um, held you back and the other one mentally held you back in a sort of way, um, in, in my interpretation. So when we look at all of that, the, we had a lot of, um, not revolts per se, but protests that moved up along the way over, over a number of years from, like you mentioned, for the, the riots and then the strikes and everything that keep building up and getting more momentum. But it really never was hitting the tipping point. Uh, my personal view is it's the women who caused it to hit the tipping point. But, um, you know, that a lot of people would argue with me with that. But so what, what was the movers in the, the women's involvement and getting involved um, with the political arena then because the, the majority was actually materialized. Well, I would say that um, post-World War II is really the turning point for, for a lot of, of um, move forward movement in, in the Bahamas. Um, you had the Burma Road riots for one of 1942 and um, then you, and, and you also had the, the contract um, beginning um, where, where many, many Bahamians left the Bahamas to go on contract in the United States because of the war, World War II. Um, they, there, there was a depletion of the workforce in the United States. And so they asked from people from the Caribbean, et cetera, to, to, to go to the United States to, to do certain kinds of work. So you had quite a bit of the population of the Bahamas, 5,000 or so people leaving Nassau and going to the contract. And it was there that many of them um, gained a real sense of, 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 of being racially uh, oppressed because of the institutions in the United States that further um, had their had their least aspects to them. So when these people returned home, they brought a certain kind of, of understanding of, of that kind of racial oppression and also could see how it was happening in, in, in their own country. So um, so post-World War II was really a time of, of acceleration of, of, of understanding of uh, decolonization and, and racial oppression and, and trying to, to um, resist resist all of that. And so at the same time, you had uh, women who were becoming much more um, aware of, of our own circumstances. Um, the women in the Bahamas uh, post-1942 really understood that um, women, let's say in Canada and the United States, had been given the vote from 1918 and 1920 and in Britain in 1918. So, so, so our women understood this and they were a part of the lodges and, and the, the, um, the Elks Lodge and the Eastern Star, etc. And it was in these kinds of, of social um, um, enterprises that women really uh, worked as women and, and, and were further influenced by, by international um, movements um, because they would have had connections to, to, to um, Elks Lodges and in, in other parts of the world, or particularly the United States in any case. And so you had people like Mabel Walker, who, who was a woman from the southern United States, and she had come to live in the Bahamas with with her husband, Dr. Walker, mm -hmm. and she was very a, a mover and a shaker in the Elks Lodge. And yeah. she she actually was uh, uh, was head of, of a part of the Elks Lodge, which was called the Civil Liberties, Civil, Civil Liberties Movement. And this was the movement within the Elks Lodge that was very concerned about, about racial injustice, and it was very concerned about civil liberties and, and expanding civil liberties for, for women and men. And so um, she, along with Mary Ingram and um, 
uh, and several other women, uh, <coughs> who were all, and these were all large people. And so you can see that the, the large had a very specific influence in terms of, of, of um, expanding um, our, our understanding of what was happening, not only in the Bahamas, but elsewhere, and, and the sort of cross-fertilization. In, in the lodges, women, women gained a sense of their own power, women gained a sense of, of governance and, and democracy because they were presidents and treasurers and secretaries. And so, so the lodges themselves were, were like a prototype of, of um, democracy in, in, in a smaller setting, even though in a broader social setting, you, you didn't have that. And so Interesting they, you say that the lodges were in a prototype of democracy because there's right. so many people today who believe contrary about lodges, but you know, that's just a side note. Go ahead. Right. Well, well, I mean, you know, it, it, it was there that women women really um, became very educated about about issues around civil liberties and um, and racial injustices and what they could do about it. And so one mm -hmm. of the things that they were were keenly aware of was the was the lack of the, the lack of suffrage, the lack of the yeah. right to, to vote. And um, that was one of the things that they were agitating for. The lodges were were, were um, central to the petitions that were put forward in 1952 and 1965 around, sorry, 1952 and 1958 around right. the, the right to vote. And so um, they, they were quite progressive at that time in these areas, especially around race and politics. Right. So today we have some almost well, no, what? Almost 400 people. I mean, census would say something different. 400,000 people in the Bahamas, but um, and I guess women make up about 60 something percent of that, or almost 70 percent. I think mean, like 51, just over half. Okay, so yeah. you know, I, my numbers. Yeah, you know, I'm an engineer, but you know, numbers we, we look on paper for them. We, we don't remember them in our head. Mm -hmm. um, so back in '58, I think there was some like 50. Four or fifty-five thousand women out of a hundred, mm -hmm. right? So that it's still about the same percentage as what you um, say and what we have now. Mm -hmm. But when we look at the impact of that fifty-four thousand um, women, in particular, bringing the petitions forward, um, there was a, a good number presented in the house for various persons um, on their behalf and why if there was the issue of um, for every one male that there was about three females who would have been literate um, if I am reading that right in terms of, of that and also the powers of the woman in terms of economic purchasing and its use. Could you um, elaborate on some of that? If, if well, what I would so, so, so I, I don't have the, the my ha handle on on the literacy rate in terms of women, um, and women and men in, in, in respect to what you're saying, but what I do know is that um, the women's movement was very clear that women paid taxes, women in the Bahamas right. paid taxes, customs taxes, etc., in the same way that men in the Bahamas paid taxes in that period, 1940s, 1950s. 1960s and so one of the the issues that they put advanced was that if we pay taxes we should have representation in parliament sure. and they meant they meant that not only for themselves but for the men too who couldn't right. vote because they didn't have property so so the women were so brilliant that they saw that with the american war of independence in 1776 when they said no taxation without representation. I mean, that, that was the clarion call for the American right. independence. Our women said the same thing. You know, you cannot tax us if we do not have a voice in parliament. Therefore, what you are doing is unjust, it's undemocratic, and, and we will not accept it. Mm -hmm. and so, I, I, you know, and, and these women further used the UN uh, conventions uh, uh, coming out of the United Nations to. To, to advance their cause. And so I, I think we really have to, to shine a light on the brilliance and the political savviness of these women. They were not, um, you know, <laughs> untutored and uneducated. They knew what they were doing. They were very sophisticated. 
and um, they made alliances with, with, um, with international organizations, including the United Nations, but in organizations in England, organizations in the United States, to help to bolster the cause for the enfranchisement of women, because they knew that women in other parts of the world had already gotten the franchise and, and they um, got support from, from those women. So people like Mamie Astwood, um, whom, um, whom I'm sure you know quite well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, she, she, was, she was one of our Papa choice. Yes, exactly. She was one of our suffragists. I've got the petition right here in front of me that 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 she would have signed. So so these women were just really um, they were organized. They they petitioned Parliament. Um, they protested in, on Bay Street. I mean, they did what they had to do. They went throughout the length and breadth of this country, and the petitions were signed by people in Inagua, in Andros. This was how you know hardworking they were and the visionaries that they were, and they had far less, far fewer resources than we do today. And they did the right. kind of work that they did under very, very trying circumstances. Right, and and, and you're saying that um, my understanding is that, um, especially from my grandmother, that a lot of the women built the confidence um, because when they had that exposure and were able to see what persons were doing in other parts of the world mm -hmm. and realize that they were doing or can have the capacity to do just as good or a better job mm -hmm. that they build up confidence. And then when they networked and got together, as they say, being down, women catch a fire, the devil will run. So, uh, right. That we have majority rule. Right, and I mean, and, 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 and they were very clear that they needed the, um, the support of, 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 of the men in parliament, you know, the support right. of um, Arthur Hanna and, and, and um, all the men who were there, Milo Butler. And so, and so they, they formed alliances with these people. They formed alliances with Sarandal Fox and the labor movement. And so, um, and, and, and in fact, they were the backbone of, of the Progressive Liberal Party. I mean, these women were the backbone of the Progressive Liberal Party. They were also the backbone of the labor movement. And right. so they, 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 they um, straddled many of the uh, associations and you know, the trade union movement and the, the, the political parties. Mary Ingram, as, as, you, as you well know, um, was very um, much a part of the United Bahamian Party, she and her husband. and so. Mm -hmm. she, exercise or attempted to exercise her influence there. So they were very, very um, savvy and strategic in, in, in how they managed and um, strategized around getting the right to vote for women. And um, we're, we're, we're at the end of the day successful. Okay, so now talking about that strategy or strategizing, then we talk about the 62 election and right. then the 67 election of which um, one I guess the PLP gained the popular vote and then one they weren't. And then there's one which said that there's only 2,000 women registered to vote and only right. a thousand of them voted. And um, what, what was the mindset behind all of that back in that era? Well, well I think in the 1962 election, um, it, it appears that the, the, the Progressive Liberal Party with women voting for the first time did have the the, the popular vote, but because of the, let's call it gerrymandering, let's call it the, the boundaries, the, the, the constituencies being unfairly um, distributed in terms of population density, you still had the outcome where the uh, United Bahamian Party got the majority of the seats in Parliament based on the way that the constituencies were were, were bounded and a, 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 an island like Harbor Island would have two representatives compared to let's say Grand Bahama which was had a much bigger population mm -hmm. and um, would have only had one so so the United Bahamian party regulated the, the boundaries in its favor especially yeah, so yeah so when we especially when we the constituencies on the family islands which were a stronghold of the United Bahamian Party. Yeah, and so to put that in perspective for some of us, um, basically we're saying that the family islands had say maybe, I don't know, maybe 15% of the population, but they had more than half of the seats exactly. in the House of Assembly. Exactly. That 15%. And so exactly. that, that was part of the equal equalizing effect of what majority rule 
when um, yeah. nine one volt plus the distribution and the like would have happened. Because New Providence had the majority of the population, but, yeah. but, but the seats weren't distributed. Uh, New Providence, correct. So, 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 so that was so that was. Yeah. So we know in today's world is a bunch of people protesting but they're not being effective. Why were these ladies effective? Um, well, I, I think they were effective because they, they used, um, they, but, but, but they used different strategies at different times. So um, initially you had uh, Mary Ingram and Mabel Walker, who were um, both leaders in their own community in the Queenstown and Baintown area. Both of their husbands were members of parliament, so, so they used that kind of, of influence there to, to, to um, create public awareness and, and education. Then moving on from there, you had um, uh, someone like a Mabel Walker coming in from abroad who brought, who brought her own very, very um, uh, sound uh, uh, university education and further help to, to, to bring awareness um, Along with Dr. Walker, to 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 um, black people living in, in the over the over the hill area around race in particular, and then in 1959 you had um, Doris Johnson coming in, and she had just come back from university, and she she had her doctorate or was about to get her doctorate in education, and she brought a whole another level of 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 internationalism and connections and networks throughout the UN and, and other places. And so that all of that combined with um, the alliances, both local, as I said, they, they, they were very clear to, to um, align themselves with the labor movement. So Sir Randall Fox provided an incredible support for the, for the right to vote for women. Um, they, they aligned themselves with the men in parliament who, who further carried um, they carried that they aligned themselves with the progressive liberal party by and large because that was the party that was moving for um self-determination of, of of the country and, and so the the alliances were very important it, it's very difficult to do something uh in isolation so they were very clear on the network and the the the, the power of of, of of, of, of the alliances. They were not fearful about protesting. They, they protested, they, they had petitions, they, they got people to sign petitions, all very, very much a part of, of, what, they, of, of what you need. They used, they used the media of the day, like, like social media, and so it's so much easier, but they used the newspapers, like the World newspaper, which was the organ of the Progressive Liberal Party, to, to um, publicize and create public uh, awareness because you really do need a, a media to, to, to help to advance your cause. So, so they used all, they, they hit all the right notes, you know, in terms of, of their strategy. Further, when the, when the um, colonial secretaries, uh, Alan Lennox Boyd came in 1958, just after the general strike, they met with him and they further pleaded their case to go back to, to England. They also made a trip to London itself, to, 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 to Parliament in London, and they pleaded their case there. So, so they really unturned all of the stones and um, were, were fearless in, in, in doing that and raising money. I mean, that was obviously one of the things. It's, it's how, do you, how do you fund a movement? Mm -hmm. And so they, 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 they the usual traditional thing of, of, of frying flitters and fish and everything else. And um, they also, um, you know, solicited funds from from wealthier Black Bahamians, and um, and uh, and they, they 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 planned and strategized in all of those ways. Yeah. So if women yeah. were that effective back then to find the ways, and 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 like you mentioned, you said during the Pinan era, the, the women were very um, prominent in the the movement of the, the Pinan administrations tenure government at that time oh. what what is missing today yeah um, in terms of having the second majority movement um in order to take us to the next level um i i mean i i think some of those same um, 
an understanding of the world. I mean, I, and I just want to go back to that. Um, these women understood the the the, the social currents of of of, um, po of the post World War II era. They understood that decolonization was on its way. They understood that the countries like Ghana and Kenya were fighting for independence, and the countries in the Caribbean were fighting for independence. So so they had a a, a, a big picture of what was happening. It wasn't an isolated sort of insular in, in insular picture of of, of the Bahamas. The Bahamas was connected to the world. And so, right. so I think that, that also was one of the strengths. The other strength that I think, and it, and, it, and it speaks to the question that you're asking right now is what, what is missing or what, it, these women were well aware that they had to hold what they call public education classes. So they had to, to, to um, create awareness and they had to teach all of us are, 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 are their, their fellow citizens about democracy, about what this means, about what suffrage means, about decolonization. And they held classes for, for, for people in, in Grantstown and Baintown to, to, to mm -hmm. know about the, the injustices, first of all, and also what the possibilities were. And so this was, I think, so I think public education and awareness is, is, is critical. And so I think it's, it's something that um, we really need to pay attention to in 2021. Um, so, so something like reparations, for example, which, which is, which is um, very much a, a hot topic now in terms of reparations for, for, the, for the injustices through slavery. I mean, a part, of, a part of, of making that happen is public education and awareness. So, so I, I, think, I think that is key. Um, happy in terms of how we make change. So you, you've got to bring people with you. You've got to, people have to understand what the mm -hmm. cause is and, and where we've come from and where we're, where we're heading and how, how, how we think we're going to get there. And they've got to buy into it. They've got to buy into the vision. And so it has to be a vision that is expansive and big and is not insular and contracting, but it's liberating. <laughs> If I could put it in those words, and and and, very, and, very, and, very and, very and then it benefits many people, not just a, a core few people. You know, I think right. that's that, that's that's your UN training kicking in there. Very diplomatic. <laughs> well, the, the, as I say, the, the, the suffragists had that down pack. They, they 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 did that without UN training. <laughs> Well, I mean, you, 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 you being. I, yeah, um, I, I know what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah. saying they, these women had more going for them than, than, than many than I do today. I can tell you that. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I can imagine. Yeah. Um, so when we look at where we are today and uh, moving forward, as you mentioned, um, uh, you, you talk about, I guess, our society as a whole, not just the women. Um, um, so I just want to make that clear. We're talking about the whole society is pretty much gone to insular type attitude versus the village type attitude of helping everybody along the way. Until COVID, then we get slapped about a couple of times and now we see how we need to, to never release that and, and, and bring it back. Mm -hmm. um, some of the Caribbean countries have now have women in very prominent leadership positions. Uh, my thing on leadership is that leadership doesn't have to do with positions, authority, or titles, but it, but it has to do with, with people and people moving people. But are we to a point now where we, to move forward, we need to have the image of the woman in a senior political position, or is that just a fallacy? I think, um, well, you know, this is my, some of my life's work. So um, I, I think, I think as women, we are a part of, we, we represent about half of the, the population worldwide or just over half. I think it's very important for us to have representation at the highest levels of, of, of our governance. I mean, and, and, and all of our social institutions. I, it, it's, it's almost unfathomable for me right now to understand how that how people cannot see that that is so vital and necessary um, for many reasons. I mean, we we I mean, 
the World Health Organization and the IMF have said that you know billions of dollars are lost because of the lack of of of, of yeah. productivity of women uh, for, for 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 just the economy, just for the GDP alone. Right. Mm -hmm. You know. So so even even if you're being instrumentalist um, and not sort of um, uh, in spirit, wanting this equality just because of just because it helps your G, the GDP of your country is one way that you could look at it. I mean, it's not the way I look at it. I just think it's right. a, a principle of life that, that, mm -hmm. that, that this should happen. Um, we, we we represent half the population. We should have half the representation in Parliament. That is absolutely my position. I, I don't right. see, I don't see it any other way. And so I think it is important to to have have that kind of representation. Right. And so is that that we haven't advanced ourselves in the last um, years of such, whether it is 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, whatever it is, um, in terms of women in having a rightful place. And we don't say right, rightful place because a lot of men or a lot of women feel that that's an entitlement. And then there's a lot of men who feel that, okay, because the women feel it's an entitlement, then they need to earn it and so forth and so forth so what what's what is the biggest yeah. challenge that is is blocking well, well well you know i mean it, it, it it's just a huge to be um treated in a way in, in their own country in in a way that that, that is equal to men, you know, um, it, it's not. It, it, it's 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 an entitlement for all of us to be treated as human beings. So, so um, and and in, in terms of political leadership, yes, it, it, one one has to earn that. But there there are many men in political leadership who, who are there because of the old boys network. They haven't earned anything. So so it's it's, it's you know it's, it's disingenuous of men to actually say that when they many of them have gotten where they've gotten not through through their own um, hard work but through. Right. Yeah, and so so yeah. you know yeah. exactly. Um, yeah. So when we look at the the woman, the woman or the female, the woman, female, the male. I think of mother's love, mm -hmm. right? And I think mother's love was one of the main reasons why um, the women in the majority rule movement became so effective because that that was natural for for them in terms of taking the lead and doing what is necessary for somebody who is caring. So, but in terms of our society, now we have advanced in leaps and bounds, but now we've come to a plateau. Mm -hmm. And so in socializing ourselves, we hear people talk about Arlene, um, Nash was on, on a former show and she was talking about the education levels and, and um, persons, what was happening way back when and what is happening now. And it's looked at to say that we look like we are regressing socially. And a lot of people call that on, on the family structure and a lot of people say it's on other things. But I always feel that it evolves around the mother or the mother figure in, in a community or the um, matriarch kind of thing. So. Looking at our society today, how do we get to leverage this this movement of of majority rule to be more effective in changing now? We don't do much consultation anymore and the like, but what aspects of the majority rule picture can we draw on to get strengths in order to how to improve what we do now? Mm -hmm. Um well, I, 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 as, as I began saying, uh, majority rule is a, is a principle of democracy. It's, 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 mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a voting rule. So um, we are still on the road in the Bahamas as, as elsewhere, including the United States of America, in deepening our democracy and democratizing our, our, our governance. I mean, we, we, we can see um, even in, in the United States, where which is supposed to be the bastion and the, and the hallmark of democracy, that their institutions are under threat because of the social, a lot of social injustice. <laughs> right. So in the Bahamas, we, we, we have to, to chart, chart our own course and, and our own um, sense of, of, 
where we see injustices and where we see um, freedoms um, waiting for us still to st still to be had. I mean, there are many, many, many areas. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I mean, we, we, I still don't think we have the kind of economic emancipation that 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 that, that is needed that that would impact a broader um, spectrum of, of of people in the Bahamas. I mean, it's it's it, 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 access to, to economic resources still has to be, be, be looked at for, for the majority of people in the Bahamas um, still. And so, so I don't think that that is, um, I think that's one aspect of majority rule that we still need to, to really think about and, and how that is going to, to work. Mm -hmm. So we lift um, people out of poverty and um, our, our, standard of living for people across the board is, 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 is improved because there are many areas, as you know, where people are living in desperate situations. Right. Right. Just food security, housing insecurity. I mean, yeah. So, 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 so we still have um, yeah. a long way to go in terms of, of making, making the majority rule principle work for the majority of people. Right. Yes. So before we, we, we wrap up, um, because you know, time does sort of fly, um, Eric Erickson said that in the social jungle of human existence, there is no feeling of being alive without a sense of identity, mm -hmm. right? So moving forward and um, listening to what um, the Honorable Loftus Roker had said to us before in terms of who he is, then what would you want to pass on to the general public, whether it's the, it's the, the youth, the women, or whoever, that you feel if you were given the opportunity that you are now to pass on to them, to help them become more confident people like the women of the majority rule movement and affect change in, in, in I would say, responsible ways yes yeah what 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 would i say to um sorry just to, can, can you just re, 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 rephrase yeah, the, what, what would you say to the to the public or the youth in particular and the, the, the ladies um that will allow um, them to build up that confidence on their identity of knowing who they are in terms of how the women of the majority rule era had built up their confidence. What, what would you say to them to help them mm -hmm. so we could go to the next level? So, so, so I, 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 I think we still um, have to persist in our civic engagement and our community work and our community service and do it in a way that we are in, 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 in community with other people. So, so, so we have to um, be with each other and uh, understand together what our vision is, what we want for our country, and um, and why we want it, and and what are we going to do? What 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 risks are we going to take to make these things happen? And what kinds of of programs and or you know policies. What what is it? How, how are we going to shape this vision and, right, okay. and make it into a program of action for for our community and our people? Great. Well, Marion, I would like to really thank you for taking this time. Um, I know we're a couple of days away from the actual day of majority rule, but um, this has been very informative. I hope a lot of the um, audience out there. Um, pick up some nuggets and some things that can inspire them to move and yeah. navigate their way to this, I don't know what you call this, this COVID thing and the like. Yes. But we really would like to thank you for coming on and sharing a lot of this information. Yes. And there's so much more. Yes, but, you know, so much more. And I'm happy thank you for the work that you're doing and this kind of, of awareness and public education and engagement in conversation. I think conversation is very important. And we can disagree and um Oh yes, yes. And still, and still um make it happen. Mm -hmm. Is that break bread? <laughs>
Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you All so right. much. You're welcome. And good say hello to the good fellows and okay. Madam Ladies and everybody. Okay? okay. Have a good evening. All right, good evening. Take Bye care. Now.